We're going to conduct a brief memory exercise to begin with. Okay, I'm going to give you five words, and I want you to remember those five words. Those words are scarf, cigar, motorcycle, giraffe, glasses. Say them with me. Scarf, cigar, motorcycle, giraffe, glasses. One more time through. Perfect. Now, if you go to the grocery store and you need to pick up five things, you'll probably take a list with you. Because if you're like me, you'll forget at least one of them once you get there. If you really want to remember something, it sometimes helps to put it into a different format. Those five words, you'll probably remember for a little while, but you'll get distracted and they'll go away. But if you put that into visual memory, your visual memory is hyper-efficient. It doesn't take as much repetition. So in your mind, in vision, a cartoon of a giraffe wearing glasses, tearing down the road on a motorcycle, chomping on a cigar, smoke blowing in the breeze, and scarf waving. If you can get that fixed in your mind, that, that image, those five words, they'll, they'll be with you a year from now. You can remember those five words. When you, when you learn something new, when you take on a new task, when you take on any new challenge, you physically, structurally change your brain. Throughout our entire lifetime, repetition of patterns results in changes within our brain, physical changes. Our brains have billions of fast-acting cells. These neurons communicate with each other. Groups of cells communicate with other groups of cells. Regions of our brain communicate with other regions. And that's the way in which, over time, the actions that we engage in physically build our unique brain. That process is enhanced by repetition, and the things that we do most often are the things that become most automatic. In scientific terms, we call that neuroplasticity. Neuro for the central nervous system, and plasticity for the fact that it is moldable or shapeable. Now, walking into this session, I doubt that any of you were consciously thinking about walking. You were having conversations, you were thinking about other things, and the reason that your brain is hardwired to make you a walking machine that you can do without conscious paying attention to it involves the fact that you have done that action millions and millions of times. The automaticity that you have developed through the strengthening of that pattern within your brain allows you to do a very complex task and to do it very efficiently and without requiring conscious thought. Our lives are a series of routines when you break it right down. We can do very, very complex things when you chain together those simple routines. Something as simple as tying your shoes requires a lot of fine motor. If I tell you that for the next six months you can only use your right hand to tie your shoe, wow, that's going to be tough. It's going to take you a long time to get that shoe tied the first time you do it. But the more you do that, the more you engage in that, the more efficient that would become. I'm not a golfer. Never have been. Well, miniature golf, but I don't think that counts. Um, if I decide that I want to be a golfer, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of repetition, and I'm actually going to have to engage in the context-specific task of playing golf to get better at it. I'm going to have to have a million swings before that swing becomes automatic. I can play a pretty good golf game on a PlayStation, but that doesn't relate to the real game of golf. I have to do the real thing. I can play all the tennis I like, but it's not going to make me a better golfer. I might hire a coach because a coach not only will tell me what I need to do right, it will also permit me, prevent me from doing the wrong thing. Um, a lot of us have just bad habits. Those habits are routines. They are things that we do over and over. And we say we'd like to change that, but it's really tough to change a routine. That's why it's so beneficial to have a routine that's positive and that supports what it is that you want to do and the things that you want to access. So at its basis, neuroplasticity is the process of our brains making connections, strengthening those connections through multiple, multiple, multiple repetitions, and then combining those routines so that it becomes something that we are able to functionally do that we didn't do before. That is, at its heart, neuroplasticity. Now, I am very fortunate to work at a phenomenal facility with an amazing group of staff, of people that are dedicated to a common goal of providing excellence in everything that they do. What we happen to do is operate a rehab facility for folks that have had neurological insults, so spinal cord injury, brain injury, stroke. That's the population of individuals that we work with. 
working with those individuals and developing what are the routines and the basic skills that they need to build in order to access those things in their life that give them a sense of pleasure, that give them a sense of enjoyment. Our brains have different regions that are responsible for certain things. We have vision at the very back of our brain in the occipital lobe. You have a lot of language over here in the left temporal lobe. Your frontal lobes are very much involved with reasoning and processing of information, being able to problem solve. It's also the filter that fits over your mouth and prevents all the crap you think from turning into language. <laughs> Occasionally it has a couple of holes in it and things slip through. Usually when you're tired, usually when you're more fatigued, or when you've had a couple of drinks. Those are things that dial down your frontal lobe's functioning. So the first thing that we need to do is, in looking at an individual after they've had an injury, what has been impacted? What part of the brain has been affected? And what functional impairment or deficit may exist as a result of that? But it's even more complicated than that because everybody in this room, you're all very, very different people. You all have your own unique motivations, you have your own unique skills, you have your own unique life demands. And so as a result, the same deficit in everybody in this room would present a little bit differently because the demands of your environment and your life are going to fall out a little bit differently as well. Our brains have something of a repair kit built into them. Our brain actually has the ability to self-monitor and realize that this signal is not getting from point A to point B. The brain actually can reroute that signal through pathways that remain intact when those connections between one region and another, one group of cells and another, have become disrupted. After an injury, the fact that that neuroplasticity exists is so beneficial to the recovery of deficits that exist. That repetition is so important as well in neuroplasticity in supporting, strengthening those connections. It is also very context specific. So if it is a specific type of skill that you want to train, you need to train that exact skill in that exact environment if you want to really truly successfully build in the routines that you need. And it's gonna depend on what are the motivations and passions of that particular person. If you can tie in something that is both engaging to me and also happens to be something I need to work on in my rehab program, you get the best of both worlds. Going back to the golf analogy, if I don't really want to play golf and you try to make me, I'm not going to spend a lot of time working on it. But if it's something that I'm passionate about, if I think about it at night when I go to sleep and I can't wait when I get up in the morning to go play another round, I'm going to get better over time because I am engaged in it and I'm a part of that. In rehabilitation, you're not treating a deficit, you're not treating an injury. You are working with a person to help facilitate their participation in the things in their life that they enjoy. And so it really is a very subtle, unique blend of what deficit might exist and what can we put in place now to work around that deficit or to support the recovery of that function as this person re-engages in the things about which they are passionate and about which they enjoy. Rehabilitation after injury is no different than you building your brain as you live through your life. The things that you do, the things that you repeat, it's important that you have support for those things initially. Usually that's pretty difficult. As you do that more, as that routine develops, that becomes stronger, you need less support. So as a result, you are more independent in some aspect of your life that previously you needed that support for. The repetition supports that and allows that to occur. The strengthening of those connections as you build your brain. Technology has an amazing ability to be supportive of this process, or also in cases where compensation is necessary. In other words, if it's an ability now that is compromised and I need something to substitute for that, technology can be a tremendous boon to providing that. One of the things that is being used more and more often in a rehab setting is probably something that you use as a supportive technology yourself, smartphones, tablets. If you have memory deficit, deficits after an injury, and again, most people who have a brain injury have memory deficits. It's a very complex interplay within your brain as to how your memory works. And so as a result, almost any aspect of damage to the brain results in a compromise of memory functioning. So if you give me a memory notebook and you tell me to write stuff down and stick it in my pocket, if I don't remember that I have a memory notebook in my pocket, it's not gonna be real helpful for me. Uh, part of the problem is also that memory notebook, when it's time for me to do something, can't go, hey, hey, it can't get my attention. Well, this smartphone will do that. It'll beep, it'll chirp, it'll actually send a signal to my watch. It'll remind me that it's time to do something. And so as a supplement or as a compensation, 
that simple off-the-shelf technology, which has no stigma associated with it, people pull out their phones and look at them all the time, um, that is a tremendous benefit uh, when it comes to the technology of rehab. Again, if it is something that is personally relevant, I am gonna be much more engaged in it. If you're helping me plan my daughter's birthday party, rather than just pulling an off-the-shelf worksheet, that's gonna mean a lot to me. I'm gonna be more invested in it. I'm gonna be uh, more motivated by that. And so things that are personally relevant to me are gonna be important. You have to match the technology to the person as well. For a lot of folks, we have the benefit that, that they're familiar with this technology already. It involves, at its heart, breaking down what are the basic steps that you need to learn, and then how do you build on those steps until you have a level of proficiency that no longer requires that level of support. Technology can support that across a number of avenues as well. And again, matching that to the demands of that particular individual's life. That's where it gets a lot more tricky and that's where you can't just pull it off the shelf and say, if you've got this problem, this is what you need. This gentleman right here is using an eye gaze tracking system so that he can operate his computer. He can write you an email, and there are folks that you're familiar with that use these as well, some folks that have written some very interesting books about the universe using a, sim a similar system. Um, this gentleman can write you an email, and again, on the other end of the um, email, when that shows up in your inbox, there's no disability associated with that communication. It's his thoughts, it's his information that he sends. It's just another message in your inbox, unless that's your son or unless that's your brother, and then that's the most important piece of information you've gotten all day. The holy grail of rehab is to allow individuals, regardless of what disabilities may exist after an injury, to participate in life, to be active in those things that they enjoy. Adaptive tech with mobility is also a huge area uh, when it comes to injury, neurological injury, particularly spinal cord injury. For individuals after their injury, the Equipment that they use needs to be matched to the things that they enjoy. This battle-ready chair for wheelchair rugby is gonna be very different than your day-to-day -day chair. Um, it is a specialty piece of equipment that again, you have to learn to operate because it's a little different than what you're used to operating. When it comes to looking at matching the technology to the injury, you also have to look at the level of injury with spinal cord injury. We had a gentleman um, at our facility who had a very high spinal cord injury. And as a result of that, he didn't have either upper or lower motor extremity. He couldn't operate anything with his hands or his fingers. He actually had a sip and puff system. He had a straw in front of his mouth that he could blow into or suck on, and a computer would interpret that series of ones and zeros to then operate his wheelchair. He could drive his chair by means of that. Now that in and of itself, that mobility was something that was very engaging for him. But this is also a gentleman from the Northwest who absolutely loved hunting. That was a massive passion of his. So when he learned that you can mount a high powered rifle on a sip and puff wheelchair and go out in a blind and shoot, that was something that for him was massively exciting. It was also something that was a motivation for him to learn even better how to finally control using that sip and puff system. That is a perfect blending of what someone's interested in and what they need. This particular slide, where does a young injured Marine go when he's got a tank track wheelchair? Anywhere he wants to, <laughs> just like you and me. Um, functional electrical stimulation is a process by which a computer can actually monitor the muscle output, and if that output needs to be further stimulated to get the successful repetition that you want, sends an electrical signal. So it can supplement any or part. It's a variable assist process to allow you to get those multiple repetitions to build the strength and endurance that you need uh, in this particular case for that upper extremity uh, strength building. In early 2013, QLI was proud to be the first facility in the state of Nebraska to bring the exobionics exoskeleton system to rehab. This is an amazing real life piece of Iron Man equipment that allows individuals with very limited or even no lower extremity functioning to be able to stand and walk. Think about that for a second. That is amazing tech. As a gait training device, it's also phenomenal because again, think of the coach, making sure that you do things the right way every time. From the very first time you get into this equipment, you are having a full upright body weight supported system that gives you the exact gait pattern that you need. And instead of having dozens of repetitions 
in a single therapy session using this device, you have hundreds of repetitions. And again, we know that repetition and repetition and repetition is so important when it comes to neuroplasticity. In March of 2007, a gentleman named John Schutz was driving a motorcycle in Florida when he had an accident that resulted in damage to his spinal cord. He had damage to his spinal column at the base of his neck that resulted in complete loss of motor functioning to his lower extremities. Now since that time, John has been a really busy guy. Uh, for one, he got married. He went and built himself a fully accessible home. He and his wife had three kids, and so then he figured he had to go build a second, bigger, fully accessible home. <laughs> um, all that when also kind of being involved in a lot of rehab processes at the same time. John is here today to demonstrate for us the exobionics exoskeleton system. He's accompanied by a couple of our physical therapists, Brad Dexter and Michaela Wittes. In April of 2013, for the first time in six years, John was able to stand and walk. He talked about that as being a tremendously emotional experience for him and that every minute that he spent in the EXO was not long enough. He couldn't wait to get back into it. John has also been a tremendous benefit to our program to come back and work as a mentor with our spinal cord injury program, helping guide individuals through the process of rehabilitation and having experienced it himself through his own recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, John Schiff. John. John said that after his injury, he always held a place open in his heart that something like this could come along. This device didn't exist at the time of his injury. 20 years ago, it was not even on the drawing boards. We can't begin to predict 20 years from now what kind of technology may exist to remove barriers for each and every one of us. But what I would ask you is in that 20 years, as the architect of your own unique brain, what will you choose to build? Thank you. <laughs> 